The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar of our September um, broad month. Today, we have Will Pay uh, discussing with us uh, what it's like to trans transact 100 billion transactions. But before we get started, let's do our usual um, housekeeping. Uh, Q&A can be uh, submitted to us on the toolbar. Uh, from GoToWebinar, just type in your questions there on the uh, under the questions section. Um, we will be monitoring that and we'll inter interject questions as they come through. Um, the, ses the session is also being recorded, so and will be posted out to our website for future reference and um, you know for shared with colleagues and so forth. Um, um, yeah, and at this point in time, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Cornelius Hutton. I'm the uh, Director of Revenue Integrity at ARC. And with me today is... Hi, I'm Doug Nass, and I'm the uh, Director of Fraud uh, Investigations here at ARC. We hope you enjoy today's uh, interesting webinar with Tony Ash of WorldPay. So take it away, Tony. Thank you, Doug and Cornelius, and uh, pleased to work be with everybody here again on the uh, fourth annual uh, as a uh, guest speaker position working with the ARC team and the community. It's a very exciting uh, opportunity for everybody to continue with the education, the opportunities, and be aware of the trends and uh, the gaps that we have opportunities to uh, highlight and fulfill. So. Today's objective, uh, our topics, we're gonna take a look at uh, 100 billion transactions that uh, are performed by WorldPay FIS over the last two years time frame. And I wanna set the stage with uh, giving you an awareness on, on the backdrop of this information. FIS, WorldPay, uh, we're a leader in technology and services for the merchant banks, capital markets uh, around the globe. Um, Nine trillion dollars in fund settlement uh, annually. Actually, this year's run rate is at 10 trillion at this point in time. Uh, across the uh, all markets, we perform 75 billion transactions uh, a year, uh, serving 1 million merchants, um, supporting 1.3 billion uh, cards um, with a variety of solutions totaling up between the conglomerate of the two organizations of 450 payment solutions. And we have uh, over 60,000 uh, now in our uh, staff uh, around the world with operations in 198 countries. Uh, we serve um, approximately 60% of the 10 largest markets uh, in the world and 90% uh, of the top private equity firms. And just as important, 90% of the top 50 largest global banks. So at this point in time, I believe we have 4,240 FIs in our portfolio. We serve uh, 261 million DDA accounts uh, in the process as well. Uh, and we have a very skilled team that we uh, have, have assembled through the years and have enriched even further in the last couple of years uh, that serve the airline in industry with over 25 years experience in doing so. So we currently have in our portfolio, we picked up another 14 uh, airlines in the last two months time frame, three months time frame, if you will. So we support over 106 airlines, 120 OTAs across 146 markets, uh, 25 years experience in doing so. We work very closely with regulators and card schemes, to define rules. Uh, we are integrated with all the major DDSs uh, around the world, a strategic partner with IATA as well and provide 300 payment types to the uh, the airline community, 126 currencies, doing around 40 billion transactions annually. So today we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna cut into this data a little bit, but you know, respectfully black and white data is not that uh, glamorous of a story itself. So consequently we're pulled upon our payments reports of the last couple of years our internal resources of uh, fraud site by uh, WorldPay and our other industry partners of uh, uh, CyberSource, the Visa Solution, MRC, Javelin, American, or pardon me, Airline Information, and our strategic partner of Chargebacks 911 that provides dispute management uh, solutions to our portfolio. 
Uh, today, we're going to take a look at uh, 100 billion transactions and uh, what the patterns and the trends and the, 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 the challenges and the opportunities that exist within this as well, too. So everybody knows with the stay-at-home pandemic, We've had uh, approximately a 35% increase in e-com during 2020. Uh, for the first time ever, e-com transactions surpassed $10 trillion in annual spend. Uh, we've, have, we've witnessed an increase of 35% in disputes. Uh, that's a substantial increase, creating the new number one problem in fraud. Chargebacks in themselves around 110% of over 19 uh, numbers and an increase of fraud in the area of 33% uh, as well too. So there's some very interesting uh, uh, dynamics within the, uh, the data that we've uh, put together here for you. Some of the trends on the payment methods from 19 to 20, you'll see digital wallets have uh, picked up a couple of points and they are now the most commonly used form of payment. Uh, in uh, all markets, mind you, not just travel, but all markets, with credit cards declining by uh, about one and a half points and uh, debit cards uh, a bit on the rise as well too. But a variety of different uh, payment methodologies that are taking shape here and increasing. When you look at the buy now, pay later, in 19, it was 2000, in, or pardon me, 2019, it was 1.6% of transactions, 2020, it was 2.1% of transactions here halfway through 2021. It looks like it doubled from 19's number. So we'll keep an eye on this new payment methodology that has been emerging and, and, and greatly adopted by the community itself. 2020 uh, and 2021, primarily 2020, delivered some of the most dramatic changes to the payment industry in our total history. Uh, Ecom has accelerated, obviously, during the stay-at-home pandemic. Uh, posting the highest global growth of 19% during year 2020. That exceeded the last five years of trajectory that has been uh, ticking up through the years. Mobile wallet share increased five percentage points also in 2020. Uh, that equates to three years worth of growth in one single year there, and its adoption and utilization continues to stay on the path that it is. Uh, the use of buy now, pay later, uh, set to double again by 2024. And then funding sources for mobile wallets are changing and expanding rapidly. And we are keeping an eye on that as well as uh, in, in the process of facilitating uh, these kind of transactions. When you look at the global fraud landscape, and I wanted to separate and highlight that against North America uh, for the sake of our audience and also. Uh, a call out to our tools uh, as well too. So the global rise of payment fraud went from uh, or up to 3.1% of revenue lost from the 2.4 level of 2019. Uh, here in our North American markets, uh, we're proven most resilient, still holding it only 2.6. I say only 2.6, but it hasn't increased where it has in other markets throughout the world. Uh, because again, I believe of our, our, our improved processes, our historical data collection, and the AI and machine learning that we've deployed into many of these uh, uh, tools and modules. The order of rejection rate has uh, risen to all regions. Uh, again, North America holding the most efficient rates, I guess, remains in line uh, with the uh, past historical numbers. We've had a 110% increase in chargebacks associated with e-com transactions. So that's now up to 2.7% of all transactions from a level of 1.3 in 2019. And uh, the North America's fraud management tools and processes have been able to enable lower losses than the global average. And, and respectfully, that is with regard to criminal fraud, third-party fraud, if you will. An illustration of some of these tools and the effectiveness of them, uh, back in 2019, 25%, that's one in four orders, were tripped into the manual process and um, uh, resulting in only a 3% uh, decline ratio. Here in 2021, we're down to one in four uh, transactions going into the, uh, uh, the process there. 
with only a, uh, a three still hanging at a three uh, percent uh, decline ratio. If you look at that against APAC, the, they're leading the global stats with a 23 percent decline rate of manual reviews. And uh, obviously, they need they will be tightening up, and they always do rise on occasion a couple of years later. But they, as they recognize the manual review, the process, the cost, the energy, the resources, and the uh, decline ratio. Uh, warrants uh, attention over there, and I think we'll see better numbers coming out of that region as time goes by. From the merchant perspective point of view, criminal fraud has 77% uh, of merchants are reporting a rise in criminal fraud, that in the area of 21% uh, over the last three years, if you will, averaging at a 6% average rate per year. But what's most alarming is chargebacks. And again, this is against the general market, not just our travel airline and uh, 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 aviation uh, or hospitality markets, but across general markets, where there's been a 25% increase in chargeback rates due to the pandemic. And that's across the market. Larger travel merchants are experiencing over 30% uh, uh, increase from 2019 numbers. And, and obviously we know what took place in 2020 that stimulated that uh, uh, that chargeback surge. But I want to take before I go into the the what's taking place here in these trends. I want to take a look at last year's uh, numbers. So I, I reported last year on card fraud volumes and values. A total of uh, about 105 million cards were captured by the criminals last year, or pardon me, in 2019. And uh, as such, uh, they were used to make purchases on often airlines, exotic goods, and uh, high ticket items as well too. So uh, they profited around $24.3 billion uh, in 2019 from stolen card credentials and representing them to purchase uh, goods and services. I do wanna point out that from 2001 to 2010, as we talked last year, the revenue loss to online fraud went from 3.2% in 2001 all the way down to 0.9% in 2010. And I point that out because while fraud attempts are continuing to increase or shift to different markets, we in the North American market are getting better and better at identifying them and working those cases uh, to try to trim the losses. Right now, we're averaging around 70 basis points in uh, card fraud uh, at this point in time uh, from our mature systems. But the reason I want to touch on this from last year's criminal markets where we did a deep dive down into the rabbit hole is that as we look at this year's current position, what has taken place is that friendly fraud now tops the list of concern with all markets, small, mid, and large enterprise as well too. It went from fifth position in 2019 to the first position in 2021. So this period that we've just come out of and that we're dealing with right here in the beginning of Q3 2021, this truly marks the point where friendly fraud is uh, the most prevalent issue uh, uh, trumping now criminal fraud and it's top of mind for strategy concerns. So uh, it's the number one most common type of fraud attack, estimated at 1.2 million of commerce orders and eventually identified as first party fraud. And this is where we're gonna take a, uh, a closer look at this particular topic here, because this in itself is domestic fraud uh, for the most part. And uh, there are ways that uh, this needs to be addressed and dealt with. And so uh, point being friendly fraud, this is, has increased and trumped criminal fraud, and now is required uh, requires our attention moving forward. Consumer usage in terms of taking advantage of friendly fraud, last year in 2020, 45% of consumers filed a disputed transaction during the year. And 76% of the times they contacted their issuer first and not the merchant, which is a part of the challenge. Uh, they, they, they experience convenience and resolution by way of the, uh, the issuer, and, and obviously that type of behavior was going to lead to the ease of using uh, that button, if you will, on their issuer or bank portal as well, too. The North American incident rate 
across all markets, not just travel, has risen by 9% in the year 2020. And the interesting thing here is that in eight out of 10 instances, contacting the merchant first prevents chargeback and a potentially 80% avoidance of this chargeback cycle. And uh, so the friendly fraud, the challenge is with it as well too, when it goes through the dispute system and the processes and the res approaches to resolution is that only, only 41% of the merchants uh, have, or pardon me, merchants experience an increase of 41%, but they're averaging a 43% response rate. In other words, only 4.3 out of every 10 disputes that come into notification, alerts, and, and, and into the cycle are responded to. And of those, there's an average win rate of 32%. So at less than half, being 43% of all dispute notifications responded to, and a win rate of only 32%, the net effect is a 13.7% uh, win rate for the merchant community. That leaves a substantial amount of money on the table. And uh, the one possible behavior that, that we've identified is that the expense of processing and dispute is one dollar and fifty cents for every one dollar in value obviously not a good roi now mind you large enterprises particularly those who travel with staff budgets processes they average a 76 percent response rate on their disputes uh as well we don't have a read on the win rate uh but uh, i would just, uh, uh, like to assume that because this information is proprietary to the brands that the win rate is uh, probably uh, 75 to perhaps almost 100% uh, greater than the average of the industry itself. So the, the dispute outcomes are not uh, encouraging. And it's, it, it's also when you come out of the weeds at the high level, friendly fraud is, is problematic. It's very problematic. And what I mean by that is the priorities of the issuer and the merchant are polar opposites. So the merchant's priorities is top of wallet, or pardon me, the issue of priorities is top of wallet being card usage. So as you'll see in this graph here is that when they have gone through a dispute cycle, that what happens is five, five, five to 16 percent on fuel, uh, full uh, fraud related disputes, uh, they do not use the card anymore. And uh, only around 25 to 30%, there's no change. In some cases, there might be an uh, increase or a decrease. You look at the merchant side on the right-hand side, merchants, their, their, their objective is to continue patronage of the uh, consumer. So when you have that kind of behavior, what happens is there's a 62% decline in patronizing that merchant moving forward as a result of a long drawn out complicated uh, dispute resolution cycle. So we have a misalignment here where the chargeback process is dis disproportionate to the interest of the merchants versus the top of wallet card uses interest of the issuers as well too. The, this creates opportunity to uh, to work together and uh, uh, see how this can be bridged. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. Uh, so it uh, affects customer loyalty tremendously. The very interesting thing about this is if you look on the right hand side and you look at these line graphs, the resolution process, the more contact points that there are and remittances and due diligence that's performed in this alerts and dispute and reconciliation process to minimize uh, uh, friendly fraud, that the more touch points there ends up being is that the merchant or the, pardon me, the consumer mindset shifts from the merchant over to the issuer. So uh, I think it's a clear sign that as, as merchants engage in this process and they provide the, uh, the proof of validation and verifications of the purchases and educate the consumer that they did make this purchase uh, and eliminate the uh, reasons for uh, asking for a uh, refund, then uh, that's how they they, they end up winning the cardholder back over. So unfortunately, the cardholder starts with 75% of them start with the mentality it's a merchant's fault. And at the end of the process, only 47% believe that as well too. So 
Uh, the chargeback process, it, while it negatively impacts bank usage and merchant patronage as well too, is uh, once you start working closer with the consumers, then you're able to bridge that gap in the area of their, their sentiment and uh, their, their, their way of operating. Uh, also, it's a tremendous financial impact to uh, uh, our economy as a whole. Um, uh, there's roughly over $31 billion that is involved in the clawback or the cost of chargebacks as well, too. Um, uh, issuers uh, probably have opportunity to broaden the reasoning codes, so capturing good reasoning codes or broadening them and communicating them effectively. Uh, before routing to their customer ser uh, service tier for immediate action uh, from there. Cases can be minimized by directing the consumer to contact the merchant first before accepting a chargeback claim that will help minimize uh, uh, many cases. 86% of the merchant community prefers direct involvement to uh, correct or resolve the issue with the purchasing customer. And, and, and results show that direct engagement on the part of the merchant with the customer shows an 80% effective rate in resolving the issue. And consequently, the avoidance of a claim and the avoidance and the cost of the processing itself. So when you look at the, the whole holistic picture of uh, close to $31 billion that is spent right here in this uh, dispute process, when potentially four out of five cases, uh, this can be minimized or eliminated before even hitting the cycle. And uh, that's an area that we're talking about. Yes. Yep, got a question. Um, in our webinar yesterday with Priceline and, and MasterCard, they, they talked about you know, contacting the uh, merchant directly, either the, the travel agency or the airline directly. And they said that because of COVID, the, the huge wait times were such a detriment that the cardholders were saying, I'm not going to spend hour after hour on the phone. Just it's easy to go to my the app on my phone and just dispute it. So that was a unique, you know, situation. Did uh, were, were the merchants or FIs that were you guys were talking to were were, were you know, did they have discussions around that topic as well? Yeah, Doug, that's a that's a great uh, real life case example right there that you you highlighted, and, and I do address that in a couple slides uh, uh, from here. And what happened, and obviously in our travel sector, uh, being the worst hit of all, uh, uh, compared to uh, the benefits of a Netflix, well, uh, is that. Call centers were inundated with uh, um, I, I tried to reschedule uh, a few of my cases and, and, and I worked with uh, uh, directly with the airline, directly with some OTAs. And I was told if your issue is not urgent, uh, urgent, we'll get back to you in 21 days. Um, now, being in the industry for 18 years and, and, and serving uh, payment solutions to the travel sector, I had the patience and understanding of what was going on, and I waited until they got back to me, and then we worked the issue. But I can imagine that the majority of people are not going to accept that uh, behavior and therefore just go right to the issuer for the refund. And that leads to another issue of uh, double dipping, which we'll talk about in a slide or two from now. So, yeah, that is very correct. The, the, the call centers were inundated with uh, volumes, trips were being canceled. Uh, 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 large airlines and OTAs and travel agents were unable to even respond to the um, uh, volume of dispute alerts that uh, came through the channels, the electronic channels. Many of them failed to respond to them in time, which led to an automatic chargeback. Um, and it, it was certainly, we got tested. We definitely got tested uh, 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 15 months ago. And uh, it's still showing itself now. So thank you for raising that. It's very relevant to this very topic here. Um, oh, look at that. The next slide, Doug. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking about this topic of uh, vouchers and refunds, uh, basically equating to double dipping. So, um, yeah, the airlines faced $35 billion 
refund tidal wave in a about a six week time frame in uh, March, April, and cutting into May of uh, last year, 2020. Um, so that $35 billion refund tidal wave, uh, effectively 13 billion was refunded and 22 billion was issued in the form of vouchers. Now, being in the travel industry as long as I have, I accepted the voucher and knowing I'll be able to pick up on it sometime and they gave it a good graceful, uh, uh, very extended expiration date. And uh, so that was fine by me, but that's not gonna be fine by most others uh, as well. Airline call centers had an unprecedented surge in cancellations and refund requests. And while not able to respond to the credit card issuers with the alert notification uh, processes in sufficient time, ended up getting those chargebacks. But all the while, 74% of the merchants issued vouchers while refund requests were being processed by the issuing banks, leading to an unprecedented number of double refunds. So uh, when you look at the chart on the top right, you'll see that um, uh, roughly around uh, 75, eight, uh, almost 80% of merchants had an increase in double dipping. Uh, again, that being a refund issued by the bank and that being uh, in line with the voucher that was provided to the, uh, uh, the passenger as well too. So it created an upsurge in double dip and I've heard some stories myself uh, uh, of people that benefited from it in which I'll, I'm quick to rebuttal or, or, or correct them on what the right thing to do is, but it, it took place all over uh, our, our environment. Now, fortunately, there are new tools that are starting to evolve in the marketplace to help fill this gap. And these tools are designed to facilitate the tracking, including the spend down of existing vouchers issued and or their expiration date. And uh, these tools are being injected into the reservation system and the uh, payment systems, and it's tracking where we're at on vouchers. And, and actually on that particular note, here in um, uh, uh, September here, third quarter of uh, 2021, we're now now crossing the line where uh, roughly 50% of new flight purchases are done with fresh cash, where uh, just a little bit is uh, vouchers that are being flown. So I think that we're only about a quarter, quarter and a half away from all vouchers being exhausted, be it spent down or expired, and uh, all fresh cash from there. On, on issue, but it was the chaoticness, the volumes, the uh, I don't know how any industry would be uh, prepared for what we experienced in uh, Q1 of 2020. And this is the results uh, of that. Uh, a moment of loyalty fraud. I get a lot of questions in this area and certainly we've spent many a year tracking it as well too um, again our hats off to the north american market and the tools that have been deployed but account takeovers have been on the decline since 2019 this is due to increased usage of uh, tools that are monitoring mitigating and reporting and reporting um, uh, uh, to a variety of different systems as well too so now we're at a place where 73% of organizations now deploy mitigation tools and processes to uh, address account takeovers. And that is a lift from a position of only 68% in 2019. And I remember in 2016 and 17, when it was barely 30% of uh, organizations that were tracking friendly fraud. So it's, it's good to see the community rising to the occasion to to trim that. So the reduction in account takeovers went from 37% in 19 down to 23% here in 2021 and is expected to uh, continue to decrease uh, as well too. And I want to put that slide in there, obviously relevant to fraud, but at the same time, I get a lot of questions in this area and uh, wanted to make sure that we took a moment on that. Um, I think it's very important to note that the pressures that our travel agent community experienced was again unprecedented. Uh, this is against the backdrop of uh, global travel and tourism losing $4.5 trillion 
in 2020. That is a very rich number. And there are many nations that operate uh, off of tourism travel where it might represent 10 to 15 percent of their, their GDP or even greater, uh, particularly in some of the Bahamas and, and the Caribbean and, and areas of that nature. Uh, in totality, the global airline uh, sector net losses were 126 billion for 2020. Uh, but our travel agents who work hand in hand with customers to put together itineraries and good experiences, they were in first line position with their customer base. And they had to deal with the pressure, the verbal pressure, maybe even the face-to-face -face pressure uh, in their operations with uh, uh, the pressure of a refund. Uh, complaints to the U.S. Department of Transportation regarding refunds were at $90,000. This is U.S. only. No, or probably 90,000 cases. That's a 5,500% rise from 2019 to 20. So we had experience in a historical level of chargebacks. And unfortunately, ADMs imposed over to the travel agent community. Um, so I really, my hat's off to all of our travel agents, uh, basically first responders, if you will, to the health of our, our aviation sector uh, in that area and, and working with your customers and the community in, in trying to explain to them what the processes are, where the money really is. It's not in your back office, but it's already over to the uh, uh, travel provider or, or throughout the value chain and uh, the processes in which you had to do to help those customers get that money back. So I, I believe that the impact to the airline and travel agency brands probably going to require some incentives to, uh, to restore these uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, synergies that uh, uh, have taken place. One area that was highlighted during this period as well, too, and, and, and uh, I'm the messenger here, I am not the uh, advocate uh, for this, this current scenario that we're dealing with here, but unfortunately, 45% of merchants are less likely to respond to a chargeback than the reservations booked to a travel agency. And that needs to be addressed. Unfortunately, there's less forensic data points that are being transmitted in these processes that impacts the dispute resolution cycle. Uh, respectfully, smaller travel agencies, they lack the resources, budget, and uh, skill sets to be able to manage the dispute process uh, as well. It's a lot of times not coded that well. And uh, obviously, ADMs and associated fees uh, prevail in uh, bridging uh, uh, financial reconciliation uh, with respect to these uh, charge facts. in a uh, side uh, uh, as well, too. So what can we do going forward? Well, one thing that has certainly risen uh, as a result of the pandemic is that big brands are wishing to return to the front position with the traveling customers. Look at a build insurance. As that level sits, 15% of big brands now want to improve the customer experience. So now that they're starting to prioritize improvements to the customer shopping experience, they're doing so as a fraud management tool. And that's okay. Any reason that gives them uh, any reasoning they come up with to uh, uh, to lift that uh, opportunity is good for the industry as well too. Um, unfortunately, where we're at right now is 81% of passengers say that the heightened risk of cancellation is a barrier to booking travel, and then of course they don't want to get caught up in the refund uncertainty. Uh, being that of their top concern. And I hear that at the sidewalk level uh, uh, as well, too. Uh, and, and some of my family members trying to move around last month and next month as well, too. Uh, flights that were canceled and they got stranded. So we, we you know, obviously the airlines cannot shut down such a major uh, um, ecosystem overnight as a result of COVID, nor can they pick it right back up overnight as well, too. So we have challenges with staff, we have challenges with pilots, we have challenges with flight attendants. Uh, every area that you put under a microscope is challenged uh, as we are approaching our, our rise out of this environment as well too. Um, uh, very interesting piece of information is that 62% of travelers would like to take up 
or likely to take up these pay when you fly options. And they do so perhaps in part economically, but the, the primary driver for them doing so is to reduce exposure to the refund process if they get caught up in it. Um, so I tried to help my uh, 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 son take a flight uh, two months ago. It got canceled. We now have a voucher for him and uh, we'll find out when we can spend that uh, again as well too. But you know, th these situations are still surfacing here and now uh, as we're in the Q3 of 2021. So we need to be able to provide, the community needs to be able to provide assurances to the consumer that the refund process uh, uh, dealing directly with the merchant on the service issues. And what happens is a voucher can often suffice. If a travel and passenger experiences a cancellation and cannot get customer service out of the airline brand that is carrying them or the travel agent or the OTA, that next inclination is to push a button on their banker website to enable them to be able to get a refund. And they'll do that in all cases when we're not there to respond to them and to help them uh, uh, cure the situation or resolve the issue. Um, another area, uh, how we can potentially position best and, and to be mindful of is, uh, and this is in line with our World Pay uh, uh, Payments reports, is to watch and follow and support some of the customer payment trends in the adoption of e-wallets and other alternative payments such as buy now and pay later. Um, so you'll see on the right-hand side, the consumer adoption as of first half, uh, close the first half here in 2021, is that e-wallets are now 66% of the transactions. And buy now, pay later is, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, that's consumer adoption. E-wallets is 66% of the transactions, it's globally, and uh, buy now, pay later is at 21% uh, uh, at this point in time. So this is, uh, this is an area to watch out for um, in, in, in opportunity, uh, because when you look at the second bullet point here, embracing digital payments, it automatically provides a two-factor authentication uh, process, which is performed by the customer, effectively giving you a, a digital forensic trail of this customer behavior, because they clicked it once, they had to do another, Click as well too. Uh, there could be biometrics involved with it as well too. These are very, very easy to dispute, if you will, as to whether it's fraud or not. Now, services being delivered is another story, but in terms of validating the consumer making that purchase, digital wallets are beneficial in that area. And they're also very secure, uh, offering SCI compliant methodologies uh, embedded into the technology and delivery of that messaging as well too. And it was a very interesting stat that we were able to pull out of the community that 55% of holiday travelers said they're more likely to purchase if biometrics are available. So we'll potentially credit that to the, our younger generation who are more tech savvy, who have the uh, uh, smartphones glued to their hands uh, and such, uh, rather than our older uh, um, uh, generation that uh, might not be as savvy with that, but younger generation is adopting biometrics, uh, our millennials are adopting biometrics uh, with, with every process that they engage in. Um, so we do wanna keep an eye on uh, e-wallets and, and uh, digital payments uh, of that nature going forward. What can, what can we or what should we change going forward? Well, this, this is in the area of collaboration. I know we've been talking about it for years. Um, when you look at the effort, the cost, the loss of patronage, it does warrant industry action and it warrants it now. 86% uh, of merchants want to engage in collaboration with the issuers and the banks. They broadly agree that it's needed to control this chargeback process. The majority of merchants respectfully believe that it's way too easy for the customer to dispute a transaction with the click of a button on either their phone or their, uh, their PC or laptop. And these merchants want to hold first line of defense for resolution. So when you look at the fact that eight out of 10 disputes when handled by the merchant directly can be resolved without being a dispute or ending up in a chargeback cycle, we're now looking at a potential 80% reduction in friendly fraud disputes if the merchants are positioned as first line of defense on this resolution. That in itself, 
as the ability to save $75 billion in costs and losses to the industry. So if there's any takeaway of uh, the material that we'll be covered, that we have covered and we'll cover here today, that is a, a call to action in the area of collaboration. As everybody wants to do so, I think reasoning codes can be broadened uh, to then give the proper reasoning to what you need to do to position to deal with a case uh, as well too. A lot of opportunity uh, uh, as well too. What can we embrace going forward as well too? Well, there's obviously a number of new payment methodologies that have been taking shape. Uh, they provide uh, customer service protection. Uh, some instances they settle upon services rendered and they minimize this dispute cycle with uh, immediate service disruption refund policies that are already baked in as business rules uh, as well too. That'll keep uh, uh, lessen the impact of this $31 billion worth of uh, friendly fraud chargebacks that we're experiencing here today. So safeguarding customer payments is very, very important. It's top of mind for customers as well too. So I would encourage our merchants to explore third-party trust settlement options that pay immediately upon services rendered. Uh, these solutions provide settlement to all parties in the value chain, even a consumer when required. And uh, uh, these funds are held in uh, safeguard settlement accounts and able to reflect on the balance sheet of uh, merchants uh, as well too, where sometimes reserves and holdbacks do not. Uh, uh, and as used for collateral. So uh, I'll pause right there and I have a little more material to share in the areas of market insights and trends. Uh, but before going that, which is a shift away from fraud, mind you, but just for our audience of uh, uh, tribal experts, uh, got some insights from our report. So I'd like to pause to see if we have any questions to cover. Hey, Tony, yeah, we don't have anything in at the moment. Uh, the one that we had in was, was answered or, or was or supported. Um, uh, I think maybe we'll give it a minute or so to see if any, anybody has any questions there. Otherwise, you know, feel free to continue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, Tony, <clears throat> if going back to the uh, fly now, pay later, as someone who's been on the fraud side of things for almost 30 years, my mind gets a little wild with something that, uh, you know, I can get a service now and not really have to pay. Maybe I want to pay, maybe I don't pay after. I, I can see where a lot of people would um, want to take advantage of that. What, what are your thoughts about, uh, yeah, buy now, pay later? <laughs> yeah. Um... That's my devious mind. <laughs> Uh, I'm a former banker, uh, I served with Bank of America for 10 years and worked with the economist uh, community and portfolio managers and things of that nature. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm carrying, uh, well, we're certainly supporting it. Uh, merchants want it, uh, purchasing uh, passengers want it as well too, but I'm carrying a wait and see attitude. Uh, uh, to some degree, because what we have here is we've got a we've got a buy now pay later uh, 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 layer on top of a credit card that has X amount of open to buy as it is right there in itself. Um, now, fortunately, it's currently positioned where merchants get 100% settlement. They get that settlement up front, and it's the Klarna's and the buy now pay later and the uplifts and 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 uh, the other firms that are working directly with the customer uh, in the collection of that receivable. But uh, uh, at this point in time, one in seven buy now pay later um, open accounts is uh, uh, dealing with um, some degree of uh, delinquency. Now, I do again want to say that the merchant, the airline, gets 100% settlement up front, minus transaction fees, uh, mind you, and they're minimal. Um, and then the, the firms are dealing with the consumers uh, from there. So in terms of taking credit and a limited open to buy and stretching that even further, um, I do have a, uh, a wait and see attitude as to how this, what this will look like 
in one and two years time frame. We're certainly raising plenty of capital to continue the expansion uh, in markets. But uh, you you asked Tony what his opinion was, and that's my uh, professional opinion as a result of a banking background and 18 years in payment stuff. Thank you. You were you were very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> So um, let's see here. So what uh, what I will do is I'll take a few moments uh, uh, with, uh, here we go. So let me take a moment here on the um, uh, uh, very interesting uptake in uh, airline subscription models. I used to subscribe to them before in the past when I made a lot of trips up to Toronto, probably 40 a year, 30, 40 a year. And uh, I would buy a pack of 10 uh, back then with Air Canada and, uh, and, and do those journeys as well, too. So airline subscription models are, are starting to take shape and consumers have an interest in them as well, too. So in terms of go forward opportunities to take advantage of, I would uh, be a strong advocate of uh, watching more and more airlines develop uh, subscription-based models that are uh, enabled to put packages together for the uh, traveling community. Um, we have other models of uh, buy now, uh, or pardon me, pay when you fly. And uh, Cordon Amadeus, one of our partners as well too, this is a very appealing payment option to customers. And the reason they see it, it's a smaller deposit, it's smaller dollars outstanding at risk, if you will, too. And part of that appeal is also that they don't want to go through the refund process. And uh, that, that's a driver there, by all means. We're going to see more and more either third-party solutions or tools that we put together ourselves as an industry that need to address paying when you fly versus paying two and three months in advance that is prohibitive to the consumer because they're afraid of flight cancellation, refund risks, and things of that nature. And I, I think in this next two and three quarters time frame, we'll see a heavy weighting of these type of solutions uh, moving forward. And I encourage the industry to put together the solutions. Uh, they're already out there. Some are even taking shape. Some are being adopted. We have worldwide deploying some as well, too. But that the industry do that rather than third party uh, 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 payment solutions uh, uh, doing that. And I believe we can do that uh, uh, together as well, too. Um, I'll scroll on down to, um, uh, well, obviously, number three people around the world, we've talked about that, they're paying using a wider range of uh, payment methodologies. We saw digital wallets up to 66% level uh, for the first time ever. Here's some uh, information on the buy now, pay later uh, as well too. But part of the uh, consumer is, their mentality of the consumer is effectively that, gee, I want this type of a program because if my flight doesn't get me to from point A to point B, I'm not gonna pay later. And that's not the way that the model is built. So I think when there needs to be a little bit of a bridge, um, but that lower upfront uh, payment uh, it helps passengers do a bit of uh, upsell too. When we look at B2B being down, B2B travel, excuse me, uh, being down, uh, still what it, uh, uh, barely 20% uh, of pre-COVID levels while leisure is flirting with our pre-COVID levels, then there's a lot of uh, uh, first class and premium class seats that need to be filled that were often filled by the business traveler. The buy now, pay later concepts might help fill those seats because of the, uh, the movement of money from there. The other important uh, factor as well, too, is uh, what we are witnessing is a substantial uptick in the use of virtual cards to pay out through the virtual, or pardon me, through the value chain as well, too. And uh, virtual cards and B2B, you put business rules around them uh, as well, too, are effectively fraud resistant. Uh, because you're putting a TID on there, you're putting the client name on there, you're putting the date of service on there, you're putting the merchant name on there, you're putting everything on there. It can only be used on a, a certain date range. And uh, they're easy to push out uh, from virtual terminals, very easy to come back into accounting environments as well too. So we're seeing a substantial uptick in the deployment of virtual cards for the B2B uh, ecosystem. 
So with that, I will uh, park right here and right there. See if we have any questions and, and how we want to close out from here. Hey, Tony's Doug. Well, you you ended up with the uh, the virtual cards, and personally, I they they drive me insane because if you have you know x you know a few hundred thousand dollars on a virtual card, and it's the type where you spend up to that limit, it looks in our data exactly like someone's busting out a credit card. <laughs> yeah. Without without yeah. us knowing, so it it sets off a lot of panic and. Uh, alarm until you realize, okay, pull back. This is uh, if you can find out that it's a virtual card, but um, oftentimes it looks very scary from your initial data. So, they, they virtual cards with those big, you know, five hundred thousand dollar limits on them or more uh, look mighty scary from from raw data. I, I would suspect so, particularly with what you live with day to day and the, the cases that you're investigating and, and making sure they're in good order or not. Uh, uh, when, when I look at a virtual card and other programs that uh, I have deployed, we have deployed into our ecosystem, these are specific cards with a specific dollar amount and a specific purpose and date range that are to go to the hotel or go to the airline brand or whoever is in that value chain as well too. So the source funding of a virtual card might be an original corporate card or it might be out of a DDA account. But the issue, in my view, in my experience, the issuance of a virtual card should have business rules around it that is date specific, MID, TID specific, the user's name, beneficiary user, and everything of that nature. So therefore you're seeing a virtual card for $450 or $769 that has a definitive purpose that and a date range that if it's not spent in this time frame, it expires and the money goes back into the DDA or to the corporate account. So I would uh, uh, suggest that um, a deeper dive into how they're being positioned and deployed might take some of those concerns off of you. And we're certainly here to help you in that capacity, Doug. Sounds good, we appreciate it. So my yeah, Tony is up here. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Cornelius, please. Yeah. No, no, I was just going to um, add to um, or just inform you that, that we don't have any additional questions in. Um, but uh, I, unless you have anything else to say, I'd be ready to close out. Thank you. And I do want to thank uh, uh, the ARC team for all their terrific services that they provide to the uh, community at large and, and those in our audience that attended today. Always a pleasure to work with you. Look forward to seeing you again in the near future, hopefully when our travel opens up and we get face to face again. And my contact information is up here on the screen. If anybody has any questions or able to hit me directly in that area and I'll have uh, provide access to the ARC team for our World Pay Global Payment Report of 2021, in which anybody wants to take a look at that report, you can contact the ARC team, our team or myself directly, and we'll be glad to get that over to you. And I thank you. Yes, and Tony, yeah, thank you very much for your time and, and great insights that you've provided here to us today. Um, I will now uh, end this webinar, and I thank everybody for attending. Have a great day. Thank you.